Let's talk about the Seiko Marine Master. I have recently rebought the SLA059. Now, I have not owned this specific version previously, but I have owned five different <laughs> Marine Master models in years past. So this is my sixth Marine Master 300. And obviously there is something wrong with me if I have bought and sold this watch multiple times. If I keep coming back to this, why don't I just keep it? Well, I'd like to ramble a little bit about that today in today's video. And it's a little bit embarrassing, right, to talk about your mistakes and and uh, to put that on display publicly on YouTube. But let's talk about this watch and why I can't quit it but why I can't seem to keep it. Now, it comes down to one thing. Uh, it's a beautiful watch. It has great design language. It's very much a Seiko watch with uh, roots going back to 1968 when it comes to the design, the fluid nature of the case, the great finish work, the crown at the four o'clock position. I really like the bezel. I like the font. I like the massive markers. And I absolutely love this handset. It's one of my all-time favorite hand designs from any brand, any style of watch. There is a, a definite prettiness to this watch, as silly as that may sound. It's a looker. And when you put it on wrist and you feel that weight and you see the detail work, and then you, you realize that this is not just any old Seiko diver. And no offense to the Sumos and the Monsters and the SKXs of the world, no offense to the Willards and the 6105s. This is uh, really Seiko's first premier or luxury dive watch. And uh, I mean, you notice the details. You notice the silver date disc. You notice the little things. And it puts a smile on your face. But conversely, it's kind of a stupid watch. Take a look at this from the side profile. <laughs> it's a very tall, top-heavy, professional diver with a monocoque case and then you look at the bracelet and you have, I would say, abnormally long links. And then you have this massive bulky clasp. So it ends up looking a little bit odd and floating around on your wrist a little bit with uh, just the top heavy nature of this case. So uh, yeah, you love it. But after a while, you don't necessarily want to wear this every day. It's kind of a fatiguing watch to wear. And my own problem comes in, if I'm not wearing a watch, if not if I'm not wearing it enough, why keep it? And then you factor in the retail price. You know, this watch sells for a little over $3,000 full retail. So if, if I'm not wearing something that I could get over $2,000 on the secondary market for, I could take that money and put it into my next, you know, whatever purchase that I'm looking at. So that's why... I love it. I enjoy it. And then I'm reminded of what an uncomfortable watch this is to wear on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I start hating the links. I start hating the clasp. I start, you know, uh, getting in a sense bothered by this watch, as silly as that may sound. And then I go to flip it and then I miss it because it is such an awesome watch. So I rebuy it and then it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> and I've gone through this cycle five times. So yes, there is something wrong with me, but I think it's also fair to say that this is not the perfect watch. Uh, it exposes my flaws because I keep coming back to it. But uh, let me let me tell you where I'm at right now. So when I first bought my first Marine Master 300, I had a, a lot smaller of a watch collection, and it was really my daily driver. And that's why after a year of wearing it, I got fatigued and I ended up selling it. And I think I bought an ETA Black Bay with the Rose logo and the smiley text. I think that was the one that I replaced as my daily driver. But anyways, I missed it. I went back to it. I uh, didn't do my homework. I realized that Seiko had changed the way they produced the Marine Master 300. And the second Gen 017 wasn't as satisfying, so I flipped out of it. And then I got the 001, the original uh, but then that one, I missed the, you know, I missed having uh, ceramics and I missed having a sapphire crystal like I was used to with other divers that I had enjoyed from Switzerland and from Germany. So I ended up flipping out of the 001 and then I tried the ceramic Marine Master and that stuck around for a little while. And then I ended up letting go of it. And then I got uh, a limited edition exclusive that I thought was really, really cool. And that ended up, ended up going. Uh, but I look at where I'm at now, and I really enjoy wearing Cartier. I really enjoy wearing Breitling. 
I really enjoy wearing my Rolex and Tudor and other brands that are in my watch collection, my watch rotation. And now I am at a place that I was um, not at when I first started the Marine Master journey. So I can wear this 059 and I can enjoy the heck out of it casually, right? Because this is not a, a watch that you want to dress up with. You can't wear a long sleeve shirt or a collared shirt with this watch. It looks ridiculous, even though this comes with cufflinks <laughs> with the presentation box. Uh, and I have worn it with cufflinks to church the other day. That was uh, a little bit comical, but no, I, I can wear this casually from time to time and enjoy the uncommon burgundy color with that lovely Seghai hob print on the dial that uh, is so exciting. So I can wear this. And then when I start feeling that wrist fatigue and I start looking at the abnormally long links and the bulky clasp and everything, I can go, okay, you know what? I'm going to take this off. I'm going to put it in the box. I can put that box in the closet if I want to, and I can go wear my Pasha, or I can go wear the Detora, or I can go wear the Hulk, or whatever the case may be, Sky Dweller, Black Bay Chrono. I can wear other watches and forget about my love-hate relationship with the Marine Master 300. So I think I'm set now. I, I really think that I'm set with this piece. Um, what would cause me to sell it and to possibly go for a seventh Marine master. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this. Well, I think it would come down to Seiko creating something that is mesmerizingly cool. Maybe a very interesting limited edition or regional market exclusive that I just have to have. And if I'm going to have an accent watch, a Marine master that floats in my rotation that I wear every you know few days, then I don't know that there would be room for two. So possibly this could be flipped for something cool and unexpected. You know, a really interesting Marine Master that has yet to be released. That's always a distinct possibility. But as of the time of recording this video, I'm very happy with this. And I think I've finally found that sweet spot to where I can enjoy this watch that I love. And then when it starts to bother me, like it does from time to time, instead of flipping it, just put it down go enjoy my other awesome watches and come back to this. And it's almost like having a new watch honeymoon, uh, as silly as this sounds. As I'm verbalizing this, guys, I realize this is ridiculous. This is uh, not a real problem to have. But perhaps some of you that are watching, perhaps you can relate to this. I know some of you rebuy Sumos and Marine Masters and Tunas and and uh, this is not an isolated occurrence with just me. I know I'm not alone in this craziness of enjoying horology and specifically awesome Japanese divers and watches. So let me know if you can relate to my experience. This really is unique because it's refined, but it's also not refined at the same time. It's toolish, it's a pro diver, but at the same time, it's gorgeous and it's pretty. So it is kind of an oxymoronic watch, as silly as that sounds but it's, it's the one that I can't quit. So let me know what you think. Thank you for watching this ramble today. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a great day. I'll see you next time.